here. Okay, so our plan today is um, to continue where we left off last time when I was here, which was session 10. Um, so does anyone need, I was walking around with these, but does that, did I miss anyone? Does anyone need a number 10 handout? So we're gonna be uh, going through session 10. I think we should get most of it finished uh, today, but you know, we'll see. And then our plan next week is to start uh, one or two, just one, okay. Uh, our plan next week is to start our next study, which is going to be on the book of Galatians. And I'm really looking forward to that with you. Yeah, Mark, if you could kill the lights there, thank you. Um, uh, the book of Galatians is such an important book in the Bible. Uh, of course, how do you say that one's important and others aren't? We wouldn't say that at all, but uh, the Galatians is quite unique in, in what it offers us. So we're looking forward to that together. But let's today begin with a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together as your church in community. We know that we are uh, together because of you, because you have brought us near to yourself in mercy and grace. And as we are together, we rely on one another and support one another, and that is a beautiful thing. So we thank you for this gift. We pray as that as we finish this study of our life together, that you would bless our time that we have. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're near the bottom of page one of the handout, which is breaking through to community. And what we've talked about so far is confession. We've talked about the importance of confession and absolution. We've talked about the special um, authority that the, God has given his church to be his representatives and more than just representatives, but the proclaimers of forgiveness here on earth. We've talked about how all of us have that joy and that responsibility, which is to proclaim the forgiveness of Christ to others. And we've also talked about the then the public administration of the of absolution uh, that pastors have, but that doesn't mean that we all as Christians don't also join in that. And we've looked at these wonderful promises from God in Scripture, uh, specifically thinking of that one from First John chapter one. Uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that is a beautiful thing. And if you think about it, forgiveness is essential to community. We've talked about community beginning between us and God. And so we need that forgiveness for a right relationship with him, that he takes care of our sin in our forgiveness. But we also uh, need forgiveness with one another for our community with our neighbors. And so that is important. So now we're talking about confession as important uh, for breaking through to various things. If you just look at the handout uh, front and back, you see we're going to be talking about breaking through to community, breaking through to the cross, breaking through to new life, and breaking through to certainty. So confession and absolution is going to be essential for all of those things. So let's begin. So first of all, confession helps us break through to community because sin desires to remain unknown and isolate us from community. This is where we left off. You know, the devil knows what he's doing. He, he gets us to uh, think about our sin and either convince us that one, it's no big deal, so we don't need to talk about it, even though it's truly damaging, or he convinces us of it is a big deal, and therefore don't talk about it with anyone, and so that it never gets dealt with. And so I think, again, our sinful flesh and the devil knows where our weaknesses lie and knows which way to try to push us. And so that is a hindrance to true community between us and God and between us and other people. And so Bonhoeffer is encouraging us as Christians to live in relationships where we can confess sins to one another. We realize that that's not a comfortable thing to do. We're probably not used to it. Maybe it's helpful to start with a pastor because you know that a pastor, of course, will keep things in confidence. But if you do have a trusted Christian that we confess sins to our brothers and sisters as well. And, and of course, if we've sinned against our brothers or sisters, that we um, go to them to confess as well. It's, it's better, uh, it's harder, but it's better to confess our sins because um, uh, that's how sin truly gets dealt with in a godly way. And so Bonhoeffer says, 
since the confession of sin is made in the presence of a Christian brother or sister, the last stronghold of self-justification is abandoned. In other words, when we fail to confess our sins because we're either ashamed of it or because we think that it's no big deal and we're actually a good person, we're self-justifying ourselves. And that's obviously not true justification. True justification comes from the confession of sins and from Christ forgiving us. And he does, and he will. But if we are self-justifying, in other words, seeking the justifying justification that I provide myself, saying, well, I'm a good person, so I don't do that. Or even if I did do that, that's not a big deal. That's self-justification, but that's not true forgiveness. So Bonhoeffer recognizes that audibly confessing sins is actually an, a, a method of accountability, and it diminishes our sinful nature, which loves to self-justify. We are not alone in our sin. So as we are confessing our sins, we recognize we stand together in the fellowship of sinners living under the cross of Jesus. You know, isn't that the greatest fear? That if we confess our sins, everyone will see us for how rotten we actually are. But we realize we're all rotten. We are all sinful and unclean. And when we can come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, recognizing that one is not better than the other, that we are all equally humbled by the cross of Jesus, and we see Jesus who has given his life for us sinners, uh, then we are all on an equal playing field. And we can enjoy that fellowship that we have because of that. So any <clears throat> questions about how confession helps us break through to true community? Questions or comments? Let's talk about breaking through to the cross. In sin, I remain in pride. Pride is the belief that I have a right to myself, my hatred, and my desires, my life, and my death. I want to be as God. And this ultimately is what sin is, right? Sin is ultimately pride, pride in these things. Adam and Eve believed the lies of the devil, which said, well, if you eat of it, you shall be as God. And in a way, there's a little kernel of truth that the devil twisted. It's true. They became aware of both sin, uh, their own sin, and uh, good, the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, but what they were saying was, we are not content with what God has provided for us. And we are disobeying his explicit command because we feel like we can do this better than he can. That's what sin is. Sin is saying to God, I can do this better than you. And it's obviously not good, but we are all, again, sinners. So in sin, we remain in pride. Pride is saying, well, I have a right to this. You can't tell me that I don't have the right to do whatever I want to do. That's what our sinful self tells us. But confession humiliates us in the full sense of the word, not only humiliate in terms of embarrass, but, you know, from talking about from our catechism days, if you remember, Christ had two states in his act of salvation for us, the state of humiliation which was from the time he decided to be conceived as one of us. Uh, Philippians 2 said, though he was equal with God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, he didn't say, well, I'm God, so I shouldn't have to stoop to their level. He said, no, I am willfully going as a servant to save them. So he, Christ humiliated himself. He humbled himself. He was conceived of the Virgin Mary. Uh, born, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. That is, again, from our catechism days, Christ's state of humiliation. Christ is now in a state of exaltation that the Father glorified his name, and that started with his descent into hell when he um, uh, uh, pro went there to not suffer, but to proclaim his victory over sin and death. 
He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence, he will come to judge the living and the dead. This is Christ's state of exaltation, which he is now in. He has been exalted by the Father. So that's the sense of humiliation that, that we're also talking about here. Um, when we confess our sins, when we say to God, I agree with your judgment of who I am and what I've done, we are saying, I have no right to an exaltation. I am humiliated. I am humbled because it's a dreadful blow to pride, Bonhoeffer says. In the confession of concrete sins, and that's important too, that we confess not only, well, I know I'm sinful and unclean, but I'm sinful and unclean and that has led me to do X, Y, and Z. And so we do need to confess concrete sins. If we've confessed, if we wronged our brother or sister in Christ, we confess that. We say, I have hurt you because, or if we have sinned against God, we go to God and we say, I have sinned because, and in the confession of those concrete sins, the old man, that's our old sinful nature, dies a painful, shameful death before the eyes of a brother. Remember, this is keep it in mind our confession in front of a brother or sister in Christ. And again, we won't be comfortable doing that unless we realize that we are all under the cross of Christ together. In other words, I can confess my sins to my brother or sister in Christ because they know that they're under that same uh, humiliation as well in terms of their sin. But what this does, why this is important, People say, well, why, why, why do that? Why not just say it's better to, it feels, certainly feels better at times to not confess our sins, to say, ah, no big deal. But the importance is, is it brings us to Jesus who willingly suffered the scandal of the cross. He, humil he hum humiliated himself, not because he deserved it, but because he took upon himself our humiliation, our sins to the cross. And so our true fellowship with Jesus leads us to confession. We say, I am one with Christ when I recognize that I'm not okay on my own, that Jesus came to die for me. And our confession leads us to true fellowship with Jesus. So see how that works? Our true fellowship with Jesus, so in other words, because Christ has connected me to himself, it will lead me to want to confess my sins. And when I do confess my sins, then I recognize that I am in true confession, uh, true fellowship with him, excuse me. So you see, it's, it's like a circle. Because I am in fellowship with Christ, I will want to confess my sins. And because I confess my sins, I will be in true fellowship with my Savior, Jesus. When one of those two things is broken, when I'm willingly allowing sin to break my fellowship with Jesus or with my brothers or sisters in Christ and therefore Jesus, then that will hinder my life of confession. And likewise, when my life of confession is hindered, uh, then I will realize that I'm not in good fellowship with Jesus. Now, that's not to say that we always need to be perfect, because we can't be. And that's also not to say that uh, we need to spend all of our waking moments in confession. This, I think I've shared this with you before. This was Martin Luther's assumption. Uh, he was so consumed with how to get right with a just God before he had his discovery of the gospel that he thought uh, it would require him to name each and every sin before God. And if he, if he forgot something, then he had to turn right back around and go back into the confessional and speak it. And so he spent all of his waking hours confessing his sins. Now we do confess to God our sins, and we do confess to our brothers and sisters our sins, but we also make time to hear the gospel, which is that we are forgiven and that we are in true fellowship with Jesus, not because of our works, but because of what Jesus has already done for us. And so we always, so we live a life always looking at the cross. We are always looking to the cross because we realize it is there that we are truly made right. And so confession is a breaking through to the cross. Any comments or questions on that?
All right, I'd like to go <clears throat> back into scripture. We're going to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 17 through 19. And we'll give everyone a moment to turn there. First, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. And it looks like Mike has that for us. Go ahead, Mike. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Okay. So we're talking through breaking through to new life. And you see in verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So you are all new creations. So what did Jesus do for us to make us new? According to these verses. Mike? This passage is very familiar to me. I heard a teaching on it many years ago. Uh, that word reconciled in this verse comes from a Greek word. I don't know what the Greek word, but it means to reconnect. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is mankind was connected with God in the beginning through Adam and Eve. We lost that in Genesis 3. But because of Jesus and what he did for us, we're reconnected to God. We're not just connected to him. We're reconnected to him like we were in the beginning. Right. And that's so important to see that what was once disrupted by sin, God is the one who is making it right again. And that reconnection is happening. And that's what Jesus's mission was all about. That reconciliation saying, I will make a path. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am making a path for you to come back to the Father. That's so important. You're absolutely right. So yes, uh, Jesus did all that for us by his death, by his resurrection. And so what then, so having been reconciled to God the Father through Jesus, what then is that message of reconciliation or that ministry of reconciliation that Paul is talking about? What do you think that is? Calling of the pastor? How so? The pastor's in the business of forgiveness. Okay, so a pastor's job is to announce reconciliation and forgiveness to the people so that they may be reconciled to God. That's absolutely true. So a pastor is entrusted in the public administration of the ministry of reconciliation. And I'm pretty sure it's our job too, each one of us. Okay, and what does that look like? You're right. I think it, or for me at least, it, it means listening to your brothers and sisters and assuring them of Christ's forgiveness. Yeah, so Paul is saying we have a job to one another to be in the forgiveness business, right? Isn't that what Pastor Tom always says? We're in the forgiveness business. And that, that starts here. That starts with those who are sitting to your left and to your right. And this also has to do with our evangelism, our sharing the good news. That's what evangelism means with others, that we live as people who have not only been reconciled, but are seeking to be reconciled with others as well. So we are entrusted with this ministry, with this message. Um, Bonhoeffer says, what happened to us in baptism is bestowed upon us anew in confession. Confession is the renewal of the joy of baptism. Isn't that cool? Thinking about every time we have a confession and absolution in um, church, and this isn't uh, thus saith the Lord or command in any way, but just an encouragement. I encourage people to make the sign of the cross when we are uh, hearing that, because what do we hear in the invocation? We start in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that reminds me of when I was marked with a cross when I was baptized, both upon my forehead and upon my heart, to mark me as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. And then also when the pastor announces the forgiveness of sins, he says, in, you know, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And again, we can make the sign of the cross. Don't have to. But that's what's happening. It's a callback 
to your baptism, Bonhoeffer says. And not just in a symbolic way, but in a true and meaningful way. Your sins, that word of God is actually doing something to you. And so your baptism, which you are living in every single day, your baptism wasn't just a one-time shot. It's something that you are living in every single day, and confession sort of brings it to the front and says, yes, this is a child of God whose sins are once again being washed away. Confession is the renewal of the joy of baptism. And let's tie it back to what we heard in 2 Corinthians 5. In baptism, you became, for the first time, a new creation. When we think of new creation, sometimes we think of what Jesus will do when he comes back again, right? When Jesus comes back again, he will raise us up from the dead, and all people, actually. Judgment will happen, but we are not judged upon our works, but upon what Christ has done for us, those who believe in his name. And we also believe that Jesus will restore and renew all creation, including us, but all creation, the new heavens and the new earth, where heaven and earth will be one. And so there will be this new creation and God's new created people in that day. But you see, the way the Bible talks is that Jesus has come so that you can start living in that reality now. Isn't that cool? We will see that one day with our eyes, like Job says, at the last, I will see my Redeemer live. So we know that that's coming, but we have the joy as Christians to start to live in that new life, to live in that new creation now. And you go, man, I don't feel like a new creation. You know, we've got sickness and death. We've got sin. But you see, that is the beauty of living in Jesus, is that he does renew our lives so that, as Jesus says in John 11, those who believe in me shall not die. You see, even death has been changed for us. Yes, from an outward view, death seems to take our lives at the end of our lives. But Jesus says, even when you die, and he was saying that in the context of Lazarus's funeral, even when you die, it is simply the beginning of our eternal lives with Jesus. So even death isn't the same anymore. Death has no power over us. And we are looking forward to the day when our bodies will be raised and made perfect. But until then, we are new creations. We are living in that new life even now. That's the kind of transformation that Jesus gives. And that's the kind of, that Bonhoeffer is brilliant. He's connecting all this to confession and absolution because there, and in our baptism, we see all of this connected to that new life. All right. Any questions or comments about new life? Julie. Yep. Mike's coming. I mean, Mike's right next to you, but a mic is coming. <laughs> oh. I just never connected a confession with baptism. I just, the two just, I never connected it. Yeah. That's, that's really a different way to think about it. You know, um, we're again, back to our catechism days. Often we talk about two sacraments when we understand that sacraments are means of grace, like the word is, the word is a means of grace. Uh, a sacrament is something that delivers to us God's grace. And so we look specifically at baptism and, and the Lord's Supper. Many Lutherans, and even our Lutheran confessions, our, our, our book of Lutheran teachings, make room for a third sacrament, which is confession and absolution. The reason why some people don't consider it a sacrament like baptism and uh, the Lord's Supper, because uh, you see it doing the same thing. What is it? It's a conduit of, of Jesus's grace to us. That's what it's for. And God says to do it very clearly. God says to do this. Um, but the reason why some people don't consider a sacrament is it doesn't have a visible means, right? We, we talk about one of the aspects of a sacrament is that God attaches his word to a visible means. So God says, here's my word that goes along with baptism, with the water. Here's my word that gets attached to bread and wine so that it becomes my body and blood, and it's for the forgiveness of your sins. So there's a visible means when we think of sacraments, and that's why some people may not consider it a sacrament, but let's not, be con let's not let that diminish the importance of confession and absolution. It is still a means of grace. It's still so important in our lives. It's a little more abstract, yeah, which 
thanks for saying that, because Bonhoeffer said, let's not make confession and absolution abstract. Let's make it hard and concrete, which means go to your pastor if you're plagued by guilt of a sin. Go to your brother or sister in Christ when you need to ask for forgiveness. Let's make this as concrete as possible. And if you look in a mirror, maybe that is the means, the visible means. Maybe we are the visible means for this means of grace, for this sacrament. But again, it's not necessary to get hung up on definitions, but it is certainly important. Mike? The thing I think is interesting, I was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. and I've been Catholic and very a couple other denominations before I got here, but that's another story. But um, the Catholic tradition where they, they think that confession is a sacrament mm -hmm. and we were always taught to go to confession first and, and often. And because we were able to do that, we received the elements at mass the next day. Right. And being here for a few months, I, I really like the Lutheran uh, the service because in the Lutheran service at the beginning of it every part of it is we recognize our sin and ask for God's forgiveness so we're right. kind of doing that in the service itself just like the Catholics used to do in the confession before going to communion I think yeah. it's kind of the same thing done a, a different way it is and and that's it really important to recognize that that's why we're doing it Lutherans also used to do that, actually. You would have to go register for communion the day before, usually at the pastor's parsonage or something like that. Um, it's, for practical reasons, uh, uh, something gone by. Um, not that it was bad or not practical in some ways, because if you think about it, um, wouldn't we tend to take communion a little more seriously if we had had to have gone to talk to the pastor to make sure that we were, um, now you, I'm sure many people were still taking that process and, and just using it as a, you got to check a mark off the box. You know, you go sign in at the pastor's house and leave. And, you know, that's not the point of it. The point was to check in with your pastor, spend some time reflecting, saying how, you know, am I examining myself as scripture tells me to do? Um, am I, am I confessing my sins and realizing that the one who is worthy to come to the, uh, Lord's supper is not one who has sin out of his life, but is the one who recognizes he is a sinner and needs what's offered in the Lord's supper. Um, so all of those are helpful things and we should still be thinking about those things, uh, before we come to the Lord's house. Um, and, but practically speaking, that's why we front load the, the confession and absolution at the beginning of the service. Yes. Well, you know, that's a pastor's job. Uh, yes, it could be overwhelming, but uh, um, I don't know. It, it, it's a, a little bit sad that I. it might give me a better opportunity to check in with people, but we find other ways to do that. Pastor Merck. I had a good friend who was the priest at, at one of the parishes in Pinconning, Michigan. And I asked him one time, I said, uh, now that confession is no longer mandatory in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, a week, weekly con confession, I said, uh, how is that working out? He said, well, he said, only the people who don't need to come, come to confession. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and isn't that the truth with so many things? <laughs> um, yeah. Mark? So I think I, I was raised Roman Catholic as well. And it's it's a much different way of looking at things. And it's also changed, as Pastor Mark points out. But I think we need to be careful that when we do have that time of confession in our in our liturgy, at least for me, I try to think of specifics not you know there's a time for reflection usually built in there like we had this morning yeah and we need to be careful not to just say you know i don't know what i did wrong but thank you god for forgiving me we need to think about what we're doing and try to at least for me try to review that kind of in my mind yeah thank you and i think that's right and i think it would be helpful if that started even before the service 
um, I mean, we should be taking that seriously. Um, uh, grab a hymnal. We usually push the hymnal card out towards the back of the sanctuary. Grab a hymnal and just open up to the front inside cover, and you'll see prayers that you can pray before a service, and those are really helpful. Uh, the hymnal is such an indispensable tool in so many ways. Um, and it also offers prayers for other time, before, you know, before worship, before confession, before communion, after communion, you know, after worship, there, there's so, it just, it's such a nice tool for your entire life as a Christian. Yeah. 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 And I think it's just, we've gotten a little out of the habit of using a hymnal, which there are reasons for, not bad reasons, but that's why I try to encourage at least opening up a hymnal every once in a while. They're there to be used, not just to look good on a shelf. Um, okay, so continuing on. Uh, so we talked about breaking through to new life, breaking through to certainty, breaking through to certainty. Bonhoeffer poses the question, why is it that it is often easier for us to confess our sins to God than to a brother or sister in Christ? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> okay, Matt's got something. He's got the answer. <laughs> Well, there's always the uncertainty that they won't forgive you. Mm. We can't see God either. We have to do this face to face. So, okay. So there's a there's a uh, there's a mm, not difficulty necessarily, but it is more difficult when you're talking about humans to humans, as opposed to the God who we know has already promised to forgive. Okay. But you don't know how they're going to react. You don't know how they're going to react. And it's also more humiliating to do it face to face than it is in private prayer, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I agree with all of you. And I think that's sort of what Bonhoeffer is getting at. However, he points out, if you read this in this chapter, he said, how odd is that, that we do find it easier to go to the almighty and holy, perfect God of the universe we find that easier to talk to about our sins than our fellow Christian brother or sister who is also sinful. Isn't that strange? We, yeah, so we do know God loves us, and that certainly has something to do about it. And But what Bonhoeffer gets at is here talking about self-forgiveness versus real forgiveness. Self-forgiveness versus real forgiveness. And this gets to the point of certainty. So often, I think, again, this gets back to also self-justification. So often we can justify our sin in our mind. And we do that because then it makes it easier for, remember, have you ever heard the expression, in order to receive forgiveness, you first have to forgive yourself? And I think there's some truth to that. But, but what we're talking about here is deceiving ourselves into either diminishing our sin or saying it's no big deal so that we can offer ourselves forgiveness and then just move on. And Bonhoeffer says that's a trap because you're avoiding real forgiveness. Real forgiveness is recognizing how serious sin is, but then knowing that God is standing by to truly forgive you. And so how can you be certain that you're actually forgiven? How can you be certain that you have real forgiveness? Bonhoeffer says, who can give us the certainty that in the confession and forgiveness of our sins, we are not dealing with ourselves, but with the living God? How can I be certain that when I confess, when I attempt to confess my sins to God, that he is actually going to do what he says? Because otherwise, we're lost. Well, his word says so, and that's important, but sometimes we get stuck in our own minds and in this loop of self-forgiveness. And so Bonhoeffer says, a brother in Christ, a brother or sister in Christ, breaks the circle of self-deception. Again, it's that audible conversation that happens, the concreteness of confession. When we, when we just think of confession and absolution in the abstract, and we always keep it there, that's why I appreciate your comment, Mark, that like when I'm saying those words in church, that I'm actually saying them. 
And I don't just mean like, hey, God, holy high five. Thanks for forgiving my sins. But actually have spent time thinking about, I have broken, I have transgressed the law of God and am a sinner and am in need of forgiveness. That's where Bonhoeffer says a fellow Christian brings that concreteness to you. And so we speak to one another the words of forgiveness. Remember the little phrase I taught you that might help if someone is confessing their sins to you, or maybe it wasn't even a sin against you, but maybe they're just sharing with you that they're, you know, um, just a sin that they've committed that they feel guilty about. You can start that conversation. Here's a good way to do it, saying, I have good news for you. God has forgiven your sin. Jesus died for your sin so that you may be forgiven. And just hearing that breaks that circle of self-deception, Bonhoeffer says. And what, why that's important is it gets us to the certainty. Yes, we read all the Bible passages where God promises to forgive our sins. But again, our sinful nature and the devil is so good at convincing us that God's word can't be trusted. And that's what he did to Adam and Eve, and that's what he's been doing to us ever since. Yes, we know God said he will forgive your sin, but can he forgive you? And the devil says, you can't trust him. He's the holy God. Mike? Uh, we did a Bible study a few years ago, and I had to look it up to make sure of the it's in the Lutheran Hour Ministries um, men's network, and it's called uh, Journey from Unbelief to Faith. And what they did was is they had four sessions, and each session took a person and uh, kind of gave an overview of their life. And these are real people. And in the first one, it was a, a woman who had suffered from depression for years, so much so that you know she was going and having like electroshock therapy and things like that. And what it really came down to was she was forgiven, you know, within our within our church and all, but she couldn't forgive herself. And, you know, I, it's something I never forgot because we can be very, very hard on ourselves um, when we are forgiven, even though we're forgiven. Right. And other people say, you know, why do you, why do you Lutherans and Catholics for that matter, why do you guys focus so much on sin and, and forgiveness that, you know, the evangelical Christian, uh, you know, non-denom Christians or, or other strains will focus sort of on the event of conversion. They place a lot of emphasis on when they made a decision for Christ or something like that. And they say, yeah, I know that my sins are forgiven and it happened then. And now the rest of my life is focused on sort of my sanctified living. And, and I don't need to talk so much about sin and all that. And, you know, you Lutherans, you're weird. You, you talk about sin every single Sunday and, and you have this confession. That, Why do you do that? And the reason is because, yes, even though, and, you know, this is what my sermon today is all about. Yes, we are supposed to grow and mature in our faith, in our sanctified living. But that doesn't mean that we move past being sinful and unclean. We need to hear that we are forgiven. And sometimes someone who is really struggling with sin, yes, we are our, our harshest critic. We are the one who reminds ourselves of that guilt and shame the most often. And so we need to audibly hear, and that's Bonhoeffer's point, you need your brothers and sisters in Christ, you need your pastor to audibly tell you, you are forgiven, and that does something to us. There is power in God's word, not because of us, but because of him. And so that word will act, because it is living and active, upon us to work through. We are so quick to jump to medical treatment or even mental treatment, uh, you know, Thanks be to God that mental treatment is less taboo these days that we can actually talk about how we need good mental health. We shouldn't also neglect our spiritual health because we are not like, I don't, you know, from like eight to 10 in the morning, that's not like spiritual Joe. And then from 10 to 12, that's physical Joe. And then from 12 to two, that's emotional Joe. You know, I'm not separated people. We are made whole by God. So if we're talking about our health, let's talk about our whole health, which includes our spiritual, mental, emotional health. That's how God created us. And that's how God has saved us. He has saved us body, soul, emotions, and spirit. 
So yeah, thanks, Mike. <clears throat> so we need to be clear as we're talking about confession. Is it a divine law? This is where we might disagree with the Roman Catholic Church, which does make it a law for its members. And we don't disagree with them that confession's not good. It is, and we should do it. It's not a divine law. There isn't, you know, certain times of the day or the week or the year that you have to go to confession. And again, in confession, we're talking about confession to God, confession to brothers and sisters, confession to pastor, confession in church. It's not a divine law. It's meant to be a divine help. We neglect confession and absolution at our own detriment. So it's not mandatory, but it's good. And again, it comes back to the certainty. How can we be certain that we are indeed forgiven? All right, so confession, breaking through to certainty. Any questions or comments on that? Julie. <laughs> now, I agree with Mike. You know, you know that the Lord has forgiven you, but if it's something more major, it's harder to forgive yourself. You know you're forgiven by God, but give, forgiving yourself is the hardest part. It is. It's very hard. Um, and so we we think about what's the alternative. Oftentimes we think the alternative of not confessing is better. And it may be easier in the moment. And so it's harder to confess to God and to confess to our brothers or sisters in Christ. But think about the joy that is not possible unless we do. And again, this gets back to fellowship. This gets back to our life together. Fellowship is uh, achieved when we are reconciled to God and to one another. All right. So just a couple more things here as we wrap up. So who should we confess to? We've been talking about this, but let's just make it clear. Bonhoeffer says, anyone who has once been horrified by the dreadfulness of his own sin that nailed Jesus to the cross will no longer be horrified by even the rankest sins of a brother. So again, maturity in the faith means we recognize that we are no better or worse than other people. And we can serve them by hearing their sins. And we're not appalled by that because we're not deceiving ourselves to think that we're somehow better than those sins. If we think that we're somehow less sinful than our brother or sister in Christ, then we probably should be spending some more time in reflection, a reflection of that. And it is not experience of life so in other words, you know, we might say, I'm not qualified to listen to someone else's uh, confession. I'm not experienced enough in life. And Bonhoeffer says it's not experience of life, but experience of the cross that makes one a worthy hearer of confessions. So again, if we all are looking towards the cross and we all realize we're living under the cross, that is that Christ died for my sins. I don't need to have great experience in order to be a worthy hearer of your confessions. I will hear your confession, recognizing that you are a brother or sister in Christ, and that we both are looking to the one who has come to do something about our sins. That's what it's all about. Just need ears, yeah. And we have two of those and only one mouth. So again, <laughs> let's keep that in mind too. Um, so let me just stop here for a moment. Um, what do you think? So if, if you're not used to talking to people about confession or hearing confession or confessing to your brother or sister in Christ, whether that's a family member or a friend or a member at church, what do you, let's just pause here. What are just some practical ways where we can just take baby steps in that regard? What would be one just simple practical way where you can either, um, start to encourage a life of confession in our church? What are ways we could do that? Tom. What we can do while we're with other believers who might be more uncomfortable than us is we can make minor confessions of our sins in front of them so that it becomes more normalized to them. Yeah. And 
Absolutely right. And I would say to go along with that, let's pay attention to our language as we do that. Let's say the, you know, the words, um, I confess my sins, I am sorry for my sins. And if we are a hearer of that, if we hear someone, either one-on-one -on -one or in a small group, say, I'm sorry, or I confess, to make sure that we don't leave them hanging. And to say, I have good news for you. Jesus forgives you. You know, let's actually use the language we've been given because it's important to hear. Mike? Again, not to uh, dwell too much on my background. Uh, there are those of us that have been involved in various 12-step groups. I mentioned that to you before. And fourth step is when you do an inventory. And fifth step is when you talk to another person about that inventory. And the only reason why I'm bringing that up now, because I've had many, many experiences at that, both on both ends, having someone be my mentor on one end and other than being a mentor to somebody else. But in that process, it's always more helpful when the two get together that both people share some of the things in that inventory. It's not just one person. Yeah. We pray before we start and then both individuals share some things. It makes the whole process much, much easier. Yeah. That's true. You need someone you can trust, someone you can confide in and know that they're not going to go and talk about it with everyone else. Yeah. Julie? Somebody, and I'll get your reaction to this. We, I heard in church somewhere that um, saying you're sorry is a lot different than saying, can I ask for, I want to ask for your forgiveness, that sorry is a shallow kind of, like I ask for your forgiveness instead of I'm just sorry. What, what do you think about that? I think they go hand in hand. Uh, I don't think I'm sorry is a bad phrase to use. Sorry indicates contrition, repentance. But you're right. Um, re repentance and confession should be followed by forgiveness, if at all possible. Um, of course, there are circumstances where someone may not be willing to forgive, and that's a sorry uh, moment. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask for their forgiveness. So I think they go hand in hand. Yeah, because that's part of it. Um, yeah, Mike. If I'm wrong, uh, I will publicly be uh, maybe uh, corrected here. But I think in the, the small catechism, you talk about forgiveness. Uh, they talk about the office of the keys. And that does apply to us also, right? That yes. we can announce to somebody that they are forgiven. Yeah. And in fact, you should, <laughs> if they're confessing sins to you. That's your joy and responsibility. Now, there are certainly maybe major or more complicated situations where maybe you do want to go to a trusted mentor or pastor, um, you know, things that you don't want the whole world to know, at least not at this point, and, and they'll help guide you through that process. But what I'm getting at here is Let's make confession and absolution just part of our everyday verbiage. So as we're talking with our friends, as we're talking with our spouse, as we're talking with our children and our grandchildren, to not be content to say sin doesn't matter or it's okay, but that when we sin, we actually make a point to them. I'm thinking of children here that we're teaching them to say, you know, I'm a sinner too. I need your forgiveness. Will you please forgive me? This goes back to your point. I'm sorry. And would you please forgive me? Um, just making that part of our everyday life so that this doesn't have to be such a big hurdle every time it happens. Because if we are accustomed to those little moments throughout the day where we're asking for forgiveness and receiving absolution, someone says, uh, I forgive you and Jesus forgives you too. Um, that it just becomes part of our, our experience so that when we do have those major moments, it becomes something that we turn to uh, more comfortably. Um, so again, to whom we, do we confess? It should be anyone in the faith. Um, that doesn't mean that we share everything with everyone all the time, but that this is just part of our life as Christians. All right, now the, the chapter you notice is called Confession and Communion, and I think there's a double entendre there, double meaning. Communion meaning the unity that we have with one another the fellowship that we have with one another, but we're also talking about the moment of the Holy Supper as well. 
And so confession helps prepare us for Holy Communion, where we are reconciled to both God and man. And we've actually touched on this a little bit today, that when we go to communion, we've already experienced that moment of confession and absolution. We have been proclaimed justified. We have been proclaimed forgiven. Uh, and that's a good thing. And also, hopefully, we've spent time uh, examining ourselves, our, our own sin that needs forgiveness. Hopefully, we've been reconciled to our brothers and sisters in Christ, so that when we go up to communion, we are, we're are we not going there because we feel like, ah, I am a perfect person. No, we go up to the communion. Luther says in the small catechism, the person who is truly worthy is the one who recognizes that the words for the forgiveness of your sins, given and shed for you, that applies to me. I'm going to communion because I need forgiveness, not because I'm perfect. And we see in communion that reconciliation happening, not only between us and God, but also between us and our brothers and sisters in Christ. When I'm taking communion with you, uh, you know, as a, as a congregation, we are saying that we are also reconciled with one another. That's kind of a difference that Lutherans have compared to other denominations, that it's not just a me and God moment. It is a me and God moment, but it's also a me and my brothers and sisters moment. And that's why we place such a high value on the unity that we share in communion. And we want to make sure that that we're taking that seriously. Bonhoeffer says the day of the Lord's Supper is an occasion of joy for the Christian community. As members of the congregation are united in body and blood at the table of the Lord, so will they be together in eternity. So we call the Lord's Supper a foretaste of the feast to come. We are also thinking about the unity that we will have with all those saints who have gone before us, as well as all the saints who are coming after us. We will be together in unity, and so we get a little sneak preview, a foretaste of that in the Lord's Supper. So here the community has reached its goal. I like to think of that. Lord's Supper is a depiction of the goal. Uh, every week, you know, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's God putting before us, here is the goal that I am calling you towards. It's beautiful. The life of Christians together under the word has reached its perfection in the sacrament. So Holy Communion is quite significant when you consider it from that point of view. All right. Um, I was wondering if we'd have a little bit of time at the end, which we don't, and that's okay. Um, I'd like us to, and so I'll give you a little bit of homework this week, nothing hard. Um, we've been going through life together now for, for a number of months. Um, we've gotten through all of it. I'd like you to spend some time just thinking back and tying it all together. And what are what are what's like one or two big takeaways that you're going to take away with you um, in considering our life together in Christ? And maybe we can just spend a few minutes at the beginning of next week sharing those uh, if you're if you want to share them. Um, but spend some time in reflection of of what we've talked about. Um, and uh, consider how it is and what a beautiful thing it is that God has caused us to uh, have this life together with him and with others. Uh, after we do that next week, we will start our next study on Galatians, so we're looking forward to that. Any final comments or questions today? Thank you. Yeah, glad you could all be here. All right, let's close with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we have been given your word, your promises of forgiveness, and your assurance of our salvation, so that we may indeed be one with you and one with one another. This week, Lord, uh, we challenge ourselves to think about our life together under the cross of Christ, and we ask you to think about how that then affects how we live with our brothers and sisters and how we deepen our faith with you. Thank you, Lord, for these precious gifts, and we pray that you go with each and every person here today and all those who aren't able to be here with us today, that you are always with us and always assuring us of your forgiveness and life in Jesus. We pray all of this in his precious name. Amen. Thanks.